Good afternoon and welcome to Chatbox with Sam. Today's guest is actor Frank Collison. I, and I met Frank um, uh, last year at one of the Emmy events and he's a lovely gentleman. If you were to encourage the younger generation, what would be your main focus? My kids, um, I have three children uh, who are now off in their careers and um, somebody asked what you do, to, they're, very, they're all doing very well. And I said, you know, I really just sort of stayed out of the way. Um, and let them find what they wanted to do. Um, but they all quite early, uh, well, not extremely early, but in high school started running track and cross country. And that was the discipline that I think allowed them to uh, be successful when they chose to careers they wanted to pursue. And this is what I, t this is the thing I would say to uh, young people who want to be actors. It's a career that requires discipline. Uh, the reputation of actors is they're self-centered, they're lazy, but to have a career, any career that you're going to be successful in, you have to have some discipline. And um, that's where they got it. But the other thing I would say, and again, this is for anyone, not specifically for someone pursuing a career in theater or as an actor, is to be curious, be curious all the time um, about people you meet, treat everyone with respect. I remember saying to my son who um, graduated from the Naval Academy and he was spending um, part of his summer between years at the Academy. He was on an aircraft carrier in Bahrain, uh, enlisted men who were showing him around and showing him how they maintain the jets and things. I, he said, uh, you know, he was gonna be outranking them. And I said, yeah, well, they're the ones who know what's going on and treat everyone with respect. And that's what I have always done in my career mm -hmm. uh, when I'm on the set of, or doing theater, no matter what the person's position is, whether they're cleaning out the toilets or directing the show, I treat them all, all with respect. And um, yes. I think you get it back if you, if you treat people with respect. Um, other than that, I, I'm not sure I can say anything too much more. I'm not, <laughs> I don't Thank consider myself a career coach by any means. I've just sort of muddled along and uh, been able to to have a career um, partly by luck and partly by just a stick to it. Your father, John, and you played a Tad Lincoln and in theater when you were younger. Yeah. I was uh, telling you before, this uh, chair right over my shoulder here. There right. Is. There that it chair. is. <laughs> that chair. No, I'm going the wrong way. That chair, right? <laughs> That's there. it. <laughs> that chair was the, was the chair that has a hat over the uh, side of it, was um, a chair that my father used in a one-man Lincoln show. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny, my sister just sent me a picture I'd never seen before of my father. He was studying uh, to be an actor here in Hollywood. Um, he was studying with Max Reinhardt, for those of you who don't know, he's a very famous uh, director who fled Nazi Germany. And uh, oh, wow. so my dad was training with him and he got drafted and ended up in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, as a medic and um, came back and didn't pursue a career professionally, but he continued to write and act plays. And he had this one man Lincoln show. And he was partly inspired because one of his classmates in college was Hal Holbrook. My, my mom and dad met in college and Hal Holbrook, if, for those of your listeners who don't know, is uh, had a one man show about Mark Twain. Oh, it was, it was, it was on Broadway and Hal passed away recently. And, uh, I had oh. the privilege of being able to work with him on a movie once. But, so my dad was inspired by that, and he did this one-man Lincoln show. So 100th anniversary of Lincoln's uh, inauguration, mm -hmm. um, my dad was tapped to play Lincoln. I played Tad Lincoln. Tad. And, um, there were about 100,000 people there. There were more people at the reenactment than there were in the original inauguration. Oh, wow. My dad rode down Pennsylvania Avenue in a horse-drawn carriage. And for me, the highlight was um, after the inauguration, where there was an inaugural dinner, it was in the same room at the Willard's Hotel where Lincoln had had his inaugural dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, in attendance was Carl Sandburg, who is probably one of the most famous biographers of Lincoln. He wrote, a, I think, a three or four volume biography of Lincoln. Oh, wow. And he was fairly old at that time, but I got to meet him. I was very young, and uh, it was just the highlight of the, of the visit to, to meet him because he's a famous, very, and a, and a wonderful, wonderful poet. Oh, I love poetry. And Mark Twain, what a philosopher. No, he's yeah. amazing, amazing. Oh. I would like to dredge up some sort of Mark, I'm sure Mark Twain has a quote about, uh, about a career, but uh, I can't, it doesn't come to me right now. 
if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. That sounds so, good. Yes, that's one I mean, of Mark that's Twain. Insane. There's another one I can vaguely remember. Something about uh, if you're not very something about if you're not very smart, uh, don't say anything, or if you do, I can't remember the quote. Oh, it's something it's, about if, if you speak up, you'll and you're an idiot. You and you speak right. up, you'll you'll uh, you'll prove you'll prove that you're an idiot. I'm not saying the quote at all right, but I know I know I, I know which quote you mean though. Yes, absolutely, and it's um. Oh gosh, I can't remember it either now. But it says it's best to stay silent than yes. say too much and look like a fool. Something or like that, or an idiot. Yeah. Something, like <laughs> Something like that. We're both we're both on the right track. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Mark. You have to forgive us. <laughs> Wherever you are. People who don't read very well say, call me up and say, "May I speak to Mr. Collision?" <laughs> and I always say, "I'm not an accident." <laughs> <laughs> or at least my mother told me I was. <laughs> I know that was always the joke, wasn't it? Growing up, are you an accident or, or or was you planned? I'm like, was I planned? I say, well, God had a plan. I don't know about anybody else. Only <laughs> you have a lovely wife, Laura, and you have children, and you have grandchildren, Frank. Oh heavens no! <laughs> I started <laughs> late. I started late. <laughs> Not like you. I um, know. I've got no, I uh, no, I, I have three great kids, and they are all uh, wonderful. Um, my eldest, uh, Claire, I, who I just visited in Pittsburgh, is um, a surgeon. She's in her third year of residency, and she's currently doing um, trauma surgery. Mm -hmm. And um, sent me a selfie the other day, and she had just left a surgery. Um, a woman had been in a very bad car accident and mm -hmm. was bleeding internally, and they had to open her up and stop the bleeding, and Claire was the lead on that surgery, and uh, they saved their life. You must and be so proud of her, both of I, you and the Laura. The look on her face, she was so, when I, when I was there in Pittsburgh with her, she was about to start the trauma surgery, and she was, you know, stressing about it. For those of people who don't know what trauma surgery is, it's essentially like being in an emergency room. I mean, you never know what you're going to get. Um, but inevitably, someone is going to die while they're in your care. And I said, how have you been handling talking to patients or the families when they say, is my dad going to die or am I going to die? We talked about that and um, because that's something she has to face. And she's my little little daughter. I mean, she's Aww, not little anymore. She's I know. She's tall. your baby, though. She's your baby, though. She'll always be your right. baby. But, yeah. but she talked about discipline that I, I referenced. She, um, she ended up, uh, she ran so well in high school. She was third in the state in the 1600 meter and and at the same day ran the 3200 meter, which is eight laps, mm -hmm. and took seventh in that. So Stanford got interested in her. So she was recruited and ended up uh, going to Stanford and running track and cross country for Stanford. So I'm incredibly proud of her and um, what oh. what she's doing. And, and Eliza uh, uh, is Claire's younger sister, and she um, is a lawyer. She just graduated from law school. Um, when she was in college, um, she got a Fulbright scholarship, which is a pretty prestigious thing to get, and went to Nicaragua. She's fluent in Spanish. Oh, and, lovely. Um, she'd already spent a year in Chile and learned to be Spanish very well. So when she went to Nicaragua to do a year there working with young people, they said, oh, your Spanish is great. Are you from Chile? Because you have a Chilean <laughs> accent. So, she just graduated from law school and got a little job with an immigration law firm. And again, she texted me uh, a couple months ago and she said, we just um, went to court with one of our clients and stopped them from being deported. And they told Aww. us that if they had been deported and sent back to their country, they would have been killed. So I Aww. said, you know what? You and your sister both save lives in different ways. Yes. And then my son is the youngest. He also is a good runner. And uh, the U.S. The United States Naval Academy reached out to him and said, hey, um, would you consider coming to the Naval Academy and running track and cross country with us? So he went there for a visit and ran with the team. And he came back and said, this is what I want to do. And I said, he kept saying, Dad, it'll be free. It, it won't cost you anything. They pay, they pay for your whole education. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but you owe them a number of years. Um, and uh, because he chose to be an, a naval pilot, he owes him eight wow. years. You know, but he um, he got married, so no grandchildren yet. But uh, 
uh, I'm putting my money on <laughs> that he may may have, be the first one to have grandchildren. Um, not just because he's married, but because he he uh, he's very um, he knows what he wants. You know, yes, and I, he wants kids. And, um, oh, yes. So he is now um, he is also in the life saving uh, profession because mm -hmm. he is uh, focusing on training on um, search and rescue helicopters. Oh, awesome! So so he would be typically he might be on um, stationed on an aircraft carrier because anytime anything takes off or lands on an aircraft carrier, one of these helicopters is required to be in the air ready to swoop in. Or he might be um, transporting people or rescue, you know, if there's a yeah. situation where they have to rescue people from, from a situation, he would be going in there. So all three of my kids are really um, amazing in the life-saving life profession. And, and um, they've all worked incredibly hard. Yeah, when Gabriel was little, we lived uh, near the San Gabriel Mountains, and he thought the mountains were named after him. <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> also very smart. When I told, explained to him about dog years, you know, you know, one year for a human is seven years for a dog. Right. He paused for a minute and he goes, "Does that mean dogs have seven birthdays a year?" <laughs> oh, bless him. <laughs> the other story I remember with him. We were, I was driving the kids to school and Claire was stressed because it was picture day. She was going to have her photo taken. Right. She was fussing with what she was wearing. And her, she said, Dad, should I put my hair up or should I have it down? I said, well, I, I think you should put it up because you have such a beautiful long neck. And you know, in Egypt, a long neck is a sign of great beauty. What a nice it's thing to neck. say. And then, and then from the back, Gabe goes, he's, he's seven years younger than her. He goes, yeah, but we're not in Egypt. <laughs> you must have had some laughs when they were younger. <laughs> so what inspired you into being an actor? Well, I grew up in the theater. Um, my parents, yes. as I mentioned, my dad met my mom <clears throat> right after the war. He came home from the war and wanted to you know, finish his education. Um, I think at that point he was still pursuing. My mother was uh, um, teaching um, at Denison University in Ohio, and uh, my dad uh, ended up there at that school. And uh, at first he didn't know she was a teacher. Uh, he met her, and uh, they walked up the hill for registration, and he thought, well, I've got to register for my classes, and I guess she'll register for her classes. Then she sat down at the table behind the registration desk, and he realized, oh, <laughs> she teaches here. So he signed up for one of her classes, um, tech theater, yes. and uh, they were married before the end of the semester, and he got an A in the class. Oh. So it was right after the war, and everyone obviously wanted to get on with their lives. And then um, I was born uh, very soon after that, uh, more than nine months after they got married. And, um, <laughs> nine and a half. <laughs> and uh, they were doing a summer theater there at Denison University in a tent. And I was sort of a carry-on prop. I, I called it, uh, uh, I was a carry-on prop. Um, mm. But my second role, I called it my first non-crying role. But, uh, <laughs> I grew up in the theater. My mom was a director. My dad was a playwright. I think I mentioned to you that his first play was about an Irish immigrant family. He, nice. had, uh, he had been to a funeral, and he was shocked that everyone was getting drunk. It was an Irish wake. It's a wake. <laughs> That's what they do. Funeral. And everyone was getting drunk, and they were reciting quotes from William Jennings Bryan, and he was outraged. How could they do this? This is, this is you know, it's not respectful to the grandfather. <laughs> But that was an Irish wake. That's what it they is. did. That's what they do. So they still the play, do it now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the play takes place during an Irish wake, and it's about a young Irish immigrant boy. Um, so anyway, I grew up in theater, did theater awesome. all the time. We moved to Virginia. I was doing theater there, hauling down a big 10 bucks a night, which is, Ooh. yeah, when you handle and adjust for inflation, it's pretty good wages <laughs> doing, doing shows. And... Um, so I just continued doing theater and uh, ended up at uh, in in San Francisco 
uh, by that time we were living in California and uh, mm -hmm. it did my majority of my theater uh, undergraduate theater at San Francisco State which was right. during the Vietnam War the campus was shut down we were doing street theater we did a play about the My Lai incident um, and uh, ended up um, this I'm trying to give you the the quick version of my career it's okay. um, yeah uh, the the fellow the director who uh, who directed this show about the My Lai incident said hey I want to start a summer theater up in the Sierra Nevada um, would you like to be part of it I said sure so we went up into this place called Pinecrest which is in the Stanislaw National Forest and we had an old ski chalet and we created a summer theater program uh, we built a theater um, we had about 90 students and we did I think five or six shows each summer and it was glorious it was uh, back in the Stone Ages when my hair was really long and, uh, <laughs> and everyone except me was getting stoned I never I never did <laughs> no, but, uh, no everyone else did. but um, and uh, so we did we did um, did that and then I stayed on up there and uh, worked uh, at the junior college up in the Sierra Nevadas yeah uh, uh, and did a lot of shows I got to do roles that I had no business playing <laughs> Really? I mean, I was like, I was playing Puck in Midsummer Night's Dream. I think I'm six three. You know, Puck is <laughs> not six. I was taller than Oberon. You, know? you are tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think the same year I played the Marquis de Sade. So it's the rage. <laughs> um, and but I realized, and this I guess would uh, bleed into the area of advice uh, for young actors is that um, I was uh, a big fish in a very little pond and. Uh, I sensed that I was getting a lot of bad habits as far right. as an actor, uh, falling back on what worked and uh, not really growing as an actor. I mean, you know, I had my tricks, you know, and right. I, I was always, um, and still am to some degree, not so much an inside, uh, I, I work more from the outside in. Okay. Um, not, not, I don't, I don't put down the method and I, I've, I've used some of it. And my wife teaches uh, uh, the stuff that was taught by Uta Hagen, which she'll, I'm sure, talk to you about. Um, but anyway, so I said, look, I, you know, I need to, uh, I need to move on with my career. I could just stay up here. It's lovely up here in the mountains. Right. Um, but um, so I went back to uh, found an MFA program at um, UC San Diego. Yes. It was a two-year MFA program. They only take ten actors, and Again, uh, I mentioned about um, advice to young people. Um, the thing I liked about their program was they required you to take a, a class each semester outside the drama department. Because I've always felt that as an actor, you have to be curious about everything because you never know what you're going to end up playing. Um, so, um, so I took some. I took a course on psychotherapeutic interviewing techniques. And everyone else in the class was a doctor or a medical student, and um, so uh, I did the MFA program, and uh, so, so then you finish, and uh, I don't know if it's changed, but I don't think all MFA programs necessarily. Maybe it's better now. I don't know. Right. It's so they don't necessarily. They prepare you to. Um, they teach you to be an actor. And, we did had movement classes and voice classes and and uh, and all yeah. the other sort of things that you train for you know stage combat and all that but um, they don't necessarily train you for how to get an agent or what things about headshots they, oh yeah they sort of figure yeah you'll figure that out you know so off I go to New York and uh, uh, you know I I get some work you know I, I I toured with a company out of Boston we toured. Thirty-nine thousand miles in nine months. I played, oh wow! I played Miss Havisham, Miss Havisham in Great Expectations, among other yes. things. <laughs> if you can believe that, uh, I, <laughs> I still remember to this day. I was all in a, I had a white wig on, and my face was all powdered white, and my, the lights were very dim. And I, come closer, Pip. <laughs> you are not afraid of a woman who has never seen the light of day since before you were born. That's amazing. 
So uh, that was that was great training because we would right. we were in this this van and it was non-union. You know, it was before I was in the union, right. and uh, we would stay in uh, motels and we would show up. Sometimes we'd show up at the places we'd do high schools, colleges, community centers. We would show up sometimes. And the audience was already in their seats. We were there, <laughs> and we would set up behind the audience, the curtain. The curtain right. would open. We had never even seen what the house was. You know, whether it was going to be 150 seats or 800 seats. Oh wow! <laughs> and then we would drag ourselves back to our hotel and do it again the next day. Or sometimes we do amazing a things show in the right. afternoon, and then drive another 200 miles and do another show that night. So when I ended up finally back in New York, you know, I felt a little more like. Yeah, and not cocky, but you know, more I, confident. I, yeah, I guess it was equivalent of boot camp. Um, <laughs> my son did uh, what's called plebe summer at the Naval Academy, where they, you know, they have to lift heavy logs and swim in. Oh. It's not like Navy SEALs, but it's pretty rough training. Right. So that that was my uh, trial by fire, and so then I did uh, work to New York, and um, ended up coming back to California and working at a wonderful uh, company. Up in Santa Maria. Well, they have a theater in Santa Maria, which is just mm -hmm. north of Santa Barbara, and then they have another theater in Solvang, which is this Danish community. And I did three or four summers there, um, and that was great. Uh, all sorts of roles, you know, I played uh, Merlin. Yeah. So I did like four or five summers there, and then a bunch of us ended up in LA uh, and said, well, what the heck do we do now? And for those of you who are not in LA, um, it, this is still the case. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of small theater companies. Um, some, at least when I started here, were just people who specifically wanted to do showcase stuff so that they could get an agent and end up working in television and film. But a lot of, oh, I forgot that I also did a summer at um, American Conservatory Theater in um, mm. San Francisco, and I trained there and before graduate school. But anyway, a bunch of us a lot of people who had been at ACT and a lot of people who had been up in Santa Maria. It was called Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts. We all ended up in L.A. Well, what the heck are we going to do? Well, let's start a theater company. So we did. And it has now been around 35 plus years. It's Pacific Resident Theater. Well, we, we performed in a lot of places. But we now, when I say we, I'm no longer uh, active with the company because they're out in Venice, which is <laughs> in bad traffic is an hour and a half for me. Right. But uh, did a lot of theater there. And I mean, uh, every morning I would wake up and say, so what am I going to do today with the, with the theater company? Uh, am, am, am I going to go try to find a prop? Am I going to go build sets? Am I going to paint the floor? Am I going to rehearse? It was total dedication to that company. Mm. And this is before I had any kids. Yeah. Um, and uh, so um, I was supporting myself substitute teaching. So for eight years, I substitute taught in LA Unified School District. Oh. Um, and there's a story here, I think, again, going back to your theme of um, what advice to young people. The LA riots, the riots after Rodney King, yes. where the, there were huge riots going on, had shut down the schools. And I, I taught a lot in South Central with some schools that, um, to put it mildly, were not uh, financially supported in the way that they should be. Right. Um, the first day back after the schools re reopened after the riots, I had a second grade class, and um, there were no lesson plans, so I said I'll wing it, you know. And uh, so I, I said, let's push all the push all the desks back, put the push the desk against the wall. And I took a butcher paper and I rolled it out, covered the, all, the floor with butcher paper. Um, and then I said, get all the crayons and markers and all the blocks, and we're going to make a city. And so I said, each of you is going to pick something you would like to do in your life. Now, if you want to, if you want to uh, fix cars, you, you can you can do that. If you want to uh, be a doctor, you can do that. If you if you want to be a teacher, you know, you can build a school. And so um, they were each, you know, I didn't tell them what to do. I just said, I drew streets, and I said, you know, here are the blocks. You can make a building if you want to have a building where you work. And uh, so they. They got to it and they built this community. And then I went around and asked each of them, you know, and most of the girls had beauty parlors and the boys had uh, auto repair shops or sporting goods stores. But this one little girl, I said, uh, Tanique, well, what, what, what is your, uh, 
what is your place there? She said, it's a bank. And the class started laughing. <laughs> Uh, the class started laughing at her. So you can't have a bank. You can't have a bank. What, Tanique? would no, you can't have a bank. I said, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. You want to have a beauty parlor, right? And you want to open a sporting goods store. How are you going to get the money? Well, you're going to go to Tanique. And Tanique <laughs> is going to uh, help you out. She may give you a loan because right. she believes you're going to be a good business Amazing. person. For you. And, and, and then, then you can open so Taniqua is pretty going to be pretty important in your community, but the thing was that I she's learned smart, that day. Girl. That, well, a Taniqua is smart. <laughs> she <don't, laughs> <She's>, <laughs> Where do you go? It's like that bank robber said. Uh, Why do you rob bank? That's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> she, but but she saw beyond. None of the other students had any comprehension that they could own a bank. Right. There just was not in their in their mind because they didn't know anyone who owned a bank right know anyone what did they know you know they knew what their parents did yeah uh, and they probably think a bank was just a place that their parents go to to get money out or put money in <laughs> right but the no idea concept. that you you know so when when my daughter said she was applying for a fulbright scholarship, i never told her this but she said i was applying for a fulbright scholarship i went I didn't say it to her. I, to her, I said, oh, that's great. Good luck. And But part of me goes, oh, Fulbright, that's impossible. No, who gets mm. Fulbright? You have to be like a genius to get a Fulbright. But she said, <laughs> I got a Fulbright. <laughs> so in LA, doing theater, started getting work, got an agent. Uh, when I was at ACT, there was a wonderful um, dialogue coach. Actually, he was Irish. Uh, Charles Havahan. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Wonderful guy. And he took me aside one day after class. He says, you and me, we're going to work because we got the mugs. <laughs> what? I thought he meant like a coffee mug. He said, we got the mugs, our faces. Yeah. In, in other words, he meant we're both character actors. Right. Nice. Um, and um, That's awesome. Right. So, um, so I, I got an agent and uh, I started getting work. Uh, I think the first thing I got, I played a... Uh, a junkie on Hill Street Blues who still steals a heart that's being transported in, on its way to a uh, to a heart transplant. Oh, wow. My first line on network television, I, I hold open, I'm being confronted by Dennis Franz, he's pointing a gun at me and I, I'm, I flip open the cooler with a heart in it and I hold up a screwdriver and I say, don't move or the heart gets it. <laughs> so that was my first. That was pretty piece. heartless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I'm fun. So, uh, you know, I started getting work and uh, eventually I knew that I, I could uh, quit being substitute teacher because one of the students started saying they'd seen me on TV. One of the kids said, hey, you're on TV, right? You're an actor, right? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do some acting. And another kid goes, no, he's not an actor. Look the way he's dressed. <laughs> so uh, I go into the audition. There's a bunch of people in there. It's for a pilot, and uh, they ask me what's what's going on with you. And they sometimes do that, sometimes they don't. Right. And uh, but I was very excited because it's about to be a father for the second time. So I started talking about that, and uh, I realized we've been talking for like fifteen minutes, hmm. and uh, it was going fine, you know, just talking. And, and then they said, "Why? Well, I, I guess we should probably uh, read the scene." I said, "Oh, okay, yeah." So I read the scene, and. Uh, I don't know how long after that uh, I got the call that I'd been cast in the pilot, and that was Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Oh, I love that show. And the the lesson I learned from that, which I also repeat to, if I'm ever asked to advice by students, is um, to be excited about something and to have a life. You're an actor, yes, but you have a life. Mm -hmm. You know, you have other things you do in your life, whether it's charity or gardening or travel or art. I, my sense is that I got the role before I read for it. I got the role while I was talking to him because I came off what I am, who I am, and the way I was talking, mm -hmm. fortunately, was perfect for the role, who was this guy named Horace Bing, who's a lovable guy, right. uh, who uh, wears his heart on his sleeve sometimes and uh, comes off as maybe sometimes not too bright, but um, is is uh you know in in the Amazing. show was a very loving guy 
marries the town prostitute, <laughs> <laughs> um, but is always, uh, you know, and, but he's foul, you know. Yeah. So th- there's a touch, a touch of, um, I don't know what exactly, but that whatever it was in me, they saw it. And they saw I it. Later from the producer, Beth Sullivan, she said, I had to fight, you know, I had to fight for you. They wanted to cast someone that was more well known than you, but Aww. I fought. And so I had six years of work and uh, you did. You it came did. at a perfect time because by the time the show wrapped, uh, six years later, we had three kids. And, uh, <laughs> You've yeah, been, you, were bu- you were busy. <laughs> yeah, well, I asked my, uh, you know, my kids would say, Daddy's going to the horses. That's what they <laughs> Aww. <laughs> May I ask how it was to work on set with Jane Seymour? Well, she is a consummate professional. Um, she was always prepared. Um, she knew, and this is you know, the producer, Beth Sullivan. This is, she was, when you look back at the history of television, I think they're going to mark that Beth Sullivan was really one of the groundbreakers. She mm. was a woman producer, and she hired women writers, and um, she uh, hired a lot of women directors to direct the episodes. Um, but Jane uh, has been around a long time in theater. Mm. In, uh, in film, she knows what works, what works for her, and the old saying about you know, if it's a man, he's called. Um, they use adjectives like um, uh, demanding or not demanding. They use they use positive adjectives when a man um, r- requires certain things. Yeah. But they use the B word when it's a woman. Oh, she's such a B word, you know. And Jane wasn't that, you know. She was always polite and. And, right. and and treated everyone with respect as far as I uh, had an experience with her. But um, <clears throat> um, she seems a lovely lady. Yes, but she also knew what worked for her uh, as an actress as far as uh, she knew, oh, you're using this kind of lens, so this is what, you know. Um, that, so she protected herself and I think this, I don't, I guess it applies to men too, but especially for women is that you have to um, know, as you begin to work in the business, you have to stand up for yourself. Right. And say, especially if you're a young woman, no, I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. Or I, I'm not, I'm going to pass on that role because I don't, I don't want to, right. this is not right for me. Or as we know now in the Me Too movement. Right. Well, yeah, the, the, I think there's a lot of awareness around the Me Too now, which has brought a lot of more equal rights, including pay for actresses and actors that being at the same pay. And, um, that, and the Me Too of standing up and not being abused on or off of set for men and women, for both, yeah. both genders well, in the industry. Yes. I, I won't say the show, but I, I'll tell you... Uh, uh, Mine wasn't dealing with sexual harassment. I was doing a scene, and they had a person ready to go as my stunt double. It was made up to look like me, wearing to get on set. And um, I hear them muttering over in the corner, and I hear the director say, no, no, I don't, no, I don't want to use the stunt man. I, I, want to use, I want to use the actor. But no one asked me. So they thought it was enough of a, they thought it was a stunt because they hired a stunt man. Paid right. him to be there, made him up, and did, but didn't use him. And then told me, didn't ask me, but told me, "Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna do this time." Oh no! Yeah. And and um, it was relatively. It, it wasn't like I had to run through fire or something or flip over in an automobile. But um, you know, I I knew I could do it. Mm. But that wasn't the point. The point was that no one asked me. Right. And, and the other point was that even though I've been in the business by this point at least 25 years, I didn't feel comfortable standing up to them and saying, um, you know what, you've got a stunt person here. Use them. <laughs> Please use the stunt person. Mm, yeah. or, or I could have called the, my SAG representative and said, hey, they're asking me to do a stunt. They've got a stunt person here. They must think it's a stunt. But the director has asked that I and, and asked. She told me I was doing the, the, the piece. But I didn't want to rock the boat. I wanted to right. work against people, you know, high-profile people. I didn't want to get on their I wanted bad to side. Them the problem, you know. Mm. And um, fortunately, they- I've never been in a position where I've outright had to say no. I mean, I pointed out stuff, 
you know, yeah, in a very polite way, like um, I was doing a I had to fall out of a boat once, and and I pointed out uh, that this was kind of dangerous, and they gave me stunt pay on it. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah, but no but, one should be forced. I mean, they do have stunt people for a reason, and no one should be forced or feel they have to do something that they don't really feel comfortable doing, you know. Right. And so, that goes, and now they have this whole new generation of, not, it's a new, it's really essentially, uh, intimacy coordinators are really, sounds weird, but they're, they are the stunt coordinators for scenes of intimacy because... Mm -hmm. They, uh, the stunt coordinator makes sure that the stunt is done safely. Intimacy coordinator makes sure that the intimate scene is done safely and that no one is asked to do something um, they shouldn't do. Well, I know they clear the set now that uh, if they're doing an intimate scene, because I had a friend that was um, producing on one, directing, and everybody else was off the scene. It was just the cameraman, the actors, and then the director was there. That was it. So they they're being more protective now, uh, over yeah. over the actresses and actors when they're doing such scenes. I've noticed, yeah. and that's sag after you know. So I find that the best actors come from theater. Um, so if you haven't done theater, do theater. And if you're in LA, there's no excuse not. There's plenty of theater companies mm. that you can work with. Um, you won't make a lot of money at it, but you will meet people. You'll. You might get an agent through it, but that's not the main point, though. The main point is to um, continue to hone your craft. And, right. uh, you know, and then you're going to go in and do... <laughs> it's, the irony is you're going to go in and say four lines and make more money in two days than you would make in an entire run, well, uh, of a play. Right. It's crazy. Laura and I continue to do theater. We work with a theater company, several companies, but right now we're working with the Road Theater Company. Um, and the other thing that we've been doing for, this will be our 16th year, we go up to Alaska to um, a conference that was called the Last Frontier Theater Conference. It's now called the Valdez Theater Conference. Mm -hmm. It was started by a bunch of people, including Edward Albee and um, some pretty well-known playwrights. And it's a playwrights conference, and we go up there and we... We do played readings, and we, Laura started this, uh, we do a monologue workshop. Oh. And we use the monologues created by the writers who were there at the conference, because here's another thing, and I, I don't, I have not done a general audition in ages, um, but you should, as a young actor, have some monologues, some pieces, that if someone says, if you're looking for an agent, or um, <clears throat> if you have some, something you could show me, no. of course, now everyone has a reel. So, right, you know, reels so. and self tapes I, for the auditions. I think some young actors probably laughing at me now, like, no one does monologues. <laughs> what are you kidding? You're already crazy. But anyway, back in the day, you had to have some monologues. And uh, everyone would do the same one. So you go into a casting director's office or you go to a general audition and like 15 people do a, a monologue from Death of a Salesman. Really? So. The wonderful thing about the conference was is everyone came away with a with a monologue that no one had ever done before because they were all brand new, and we oh, still do awesome. that. We're doing it again this summer, and uh, it's great. It's great to to keep keep our hand into that, um, yeah, and also yeah. the people up in Alaska are just wonderful hosts, and they're so. Um, there's not a lot of people in Alaska that make their living as actors, but there are people there that are dedicated theater people. And they right. have worked their entire lives. They may not make their money in theater, but they've worked their entire lives in Alaskan theater. And they all know each other. Oh, what a be beautiful location to actually film, too, you know, going outside the Yeah, a number, a, you know, a number of the uh, people that live up there have done uh, shows that, they, that they come up there. Right. Yes, there is a big difference between film acting and mm. theater acting, but not as big as you think. Uh, I mean, if you have the skills in theater, I've always said, look, when I'm talking to you and you're st and you're sitting two feet from me, I'm going to talk to you like this. But if you're across the room and I say, can you get me that book over there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to project a little more. And that's what people do in theater. But yes, it, it, it is. There is an adjustment to be made and because you quickly realize, 
every little thing you do on camera is going to be caught, and you don't have to uh, work so hard. And uh, right. Um, I think I did. I worked with a wonderful actor who is now going on, Rene Aubergenois. He he had been a, one of the mainstays at uh, American Conservatory Theater in. Um, I believe he played Tartuffe there, uh, but he'd done some wonderful work there, and ended up doing a show with him at uh, Los Angeles Theater Center, a play called Petrified Forest. And he said something to me about, uh, I, don't, I can't remember the quote exactly, but he said, small is boring. And it wasn't that he was over the top, but it, there was a sort of gusto to his acting. That, uh, mm -hmm. And I think that the best compliment I've ever gotten in a theater performance is someone said, it seemed like you were really enjoying yourself. Oh, <laughs> at first I went, I thought, is that, a, is that an insult or is that a compliment? I don't know. That's a compliment. I think it's a compliment. Yeah, I take it as such. The best compliment I got from on a film set, though, was we were working with Johnny Cash, and it was it was that was one of the highlights of the six years I was on that show. He and his wife June Carter were on the show, yeah. and I found out that he was a very, very deep man, a very religious man, but did not push his religion but he was deeply religious mm. and he was deeply in love with June and she had saved his life and right. at the time we were working he was in a great deal of pain um, mm. he'd had a lot of medical issues but um, he, he brought his bus his bus on onto the onto the set this big black bus JC1 I think it said on it and his driver had been with him for years and Ooh, years sorry. and June had shown us the you know, come in and showing us, you know, like very proud house owners showing us their, their tour bus. And, um, and so I got to talking with the driver and I, I, I assume at the time I, I, it was, I had, I wasn't in costume because he said to me, he says, uh, you're, you're not an actor, are you? I said, well, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm on the show. I'm a series regular. Says, well, you don't seem like an actor. You, you seem like good people. Oh, that's a, that's a compliment. Yep. Yeah, that's a yeah. compliment. The more I realize, the less I, I know less than I thought I did, you know. And uh, uh, so you. So you're open you, and willing you, to learn more. That that's well, that's you learn, humble. That's the word I was going to say. You learn humility. The older mm -hmm. you get, you you learn humility. You learn, um, hey, I don't know everything. Uh, I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I'm just a working actor, you know. Right. And, um, With an amazing I, father and husband. Well, I don't say that about myself, but <laughs> <laughs> just well. before we were talking, I was working in the front yard, uh, trimming branches off a tree, and the little girl that, and her family that's moved in across the street, I heard her um, talking with her parents, and, and I heard her say, I want to hug him. And I didn't know who she was talking about. And... Uh, then she came across the street with her parents, and she said, Frank, I want to hug you. Oh. I said, well, I'm kind of dirty and stinky from working, but okay. Oh, how precious. <laughs> she, gave, she gave me a hug. She's, uh, you know, like five years old. And I said, you've made my day. So I, I do have to ask this question. Um, I've got a couple more. Um, you sound I've like got... you're a detective. You sound like you're a detective. Uh, I have to ask you this. Uh, where I were do. you left? <laughs> Where was she last night? What time? <laughs> what is the Do question? You have, you have, to have you got evidence? <laughs> evidence is fact. I'll take a lie detector. Right? <laughs> well, what is the question you have to ask? I have to ask out of all the charities that there are in the world, which one would you choose to advocate for and why? Well, I think because of my daughter, I would say uh, Doctors Without Borders. She's actually expressed interest, but that scares the heck out of me that she would actually do that. Mm. Um, my first girlfriend uh, was a nurse, or is a nurse. She just retired. That's how long ago we were. <laughs> and she went to uh, Thailand and nearly died over there, caught some uh, diseases. She was working in the refugee camps over there. Um, you know, I used to um, call, we would do, we would call people that had come to see our shows at our theater company to ask them for donations. And I found that incredibly difficult. Hmm. It was a little easier because they were people that had actually seen our work. And, but with all the other things and 
charities and good works that are being done, I felt a little awkward asking for help with a theater company right. when there are people starving, you know. But uh, Doctors Without Borders. I also like, and I work, I've worked with them, and I've been thinking about doing it again, although I don't know if my body is still up to it. Um, Habitat for Humanity, it's Jimmy Carter was involved with that. Um, oh. and, um, do you know about Habitat for Humanity? I do not. Can you please explain it? Well, it's it's a it's a group that, and if you've ever seen Jimmy Carter, you, you've probably seen video clips of him with a hammer, and uh, out on a building site. Uh, people uh, they find people who need a house, and they go into a community, and they work with the family. Um, the family helps out, and they build a house for them, or they oh. re refurbish a house. But I I have growing up in theater. I mean, my mom did tech theater. I I knew my way around a hammer and a saw, right. and uh, so I I would go and uh, you know usually on the weekends and uh, help um, you know uh, help with the construction. Help the props, yeah. Yeah, we uh, help help build the house, and the family would be there. The, the people that uh, oh, you did that. Oh. They would do. And they would they would be there helping out as well, um, and that's a great that's a great one. And I love the yeah. uh, Laura and I donated to um, the World Kitchen. That's doing well. They're doing great work everywhere. They did, were in Puerto Rico, but of course they're in Ukraine right now. Uh, they tend to go, as far as I know, into areas that have um, had um, um, natural disasters or wars. Oh, okay. Uh, I think they went to Puerto Rico after the, the hurricanes or the earthquakes, or they, they go, and they're they're very um, quick. They can move and get in there quick. They work with the local people. They buy food from the local suppliers. So they, they, not only do they feed people, but they support the local uh, vendors. And they oh, work amazing! With people. So they really uh, they know their stuff. Um, I know there are other medical things, um, and um, um, I, I I donate to for the kids for Christmas. I donate. For Claire, I donated for Doctors Without Borders. For Eliza, um, we donated to um, International. Oh, I forget the name of it exactly, but they help with refugees. And, okay, uh, good. Was involved with that. Uh, those people a little bit. And for Gabriel, there's a um, a group called Fisher House, which is sort of like Ronald McDonald's house. If you know about that. <clears throat> uh, Fisher House provides housing for families of veterans who are being have, having medical treatment done. Oh, that's awesome! So the veterans so, do need help out here. Yes. So like if a veteran has to go to uh, uh, New York for treatment of whatever they have, right? The family can go with and stay at the Fisher House um, while while their their loved one is being uh, treated. So. Um, that's, that's a word. Really, that's yeah. really good. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's 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 fine to give money, but it is the thing I like about Habitat for Humanity is yeah, you could donate money to them, but you can also just donate time. Yeah. Time. One of our kids I remember taking on Earth Day, which was yesterday, I think. Uh, we went down to the LA River and just picked up trash. We found some wonderful stuff down there. I bet. But I remember taking uh, I think it was Eliza with me and we <laughs> went along the riverbed picked up trash for the day. That was fun. Oh, you uh, have worked with Easter Seal Disability Challenge, which is uh, we've done it. At least the one I, we did, Laura and I did is uh, I think you have 48 hours or something to write a script. Yeah, they are. They have five, five days, five days. Uh, and, and what yeah. I did, I, I just created awareness for it. So so Dawn Grabowski and uh -huh. Meredith Thomas, as you know, Meredith, and actually my producer as well, Bonnie, she did another separate project. So I wanted to create awareness. So I had people on a live stream and I've just been posting it out on social media, hoping mm -hmm. to gain awareness for the Easter Seals um, Disability Challenge. So they get more people involved next year. And um, I haven't actually played in it myself. Maybe I will next year. I don't know, help Dawn out or something. But well, Laura the, and I you know, have done it. And Laura, right. the interviewer, you'll find out her work with the uh, actors with disabilities is she's been awarded awards and really and, oh yeah oh yeah she won't show it to you but somewhere in the in the mantle there there's an award she received is there anything 
that no one has asked you in an interview that no. you would like them to ask you? No, I, I can't. <laughs> you know, when I came into this interview, it's like, I have no idea what kind of questions you're going to ask, and I'm just going to be open to whatever you ask. I'll, I will tell you that, uh, you know, people will ask, uh, what is your epitaph going to be? And uh, I tend to deflect serious questions with humor, as my, my son does, too. Um, so what will be on my tombstone will be, uh, uh, it'll either be, uh, haven't I seen you in something? Or didn't you used to be an actor? That's the other one. <laughs> or uh, or uh, what was the other one? Um, where where you look very familiar. <laughs> that, that's that's what I get with people. You look very familiar. Do we go to school yet? But I think yes, my epitaph would be something like, "What have I seen you in?" So as I would like to say, Frank, it has been lovely talking with you on Chatbox with you, Sam. Yeah. You yeah. you my instincts uh, didn't go wrong. I knew you'd be an amazing gent to speak with. And I'm really looking forward to speaking with your wife, Laura. Um, and well, she'll give you the, the, the straight scoop. <laughs> and, and you will find out I am a very imperfect person. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> yes. We all are, because I've never, I've I've never professed to be perfect, and I never will. I'm still working on the bad part. <laughs> I don't know how to put it other, other than that. I mean, anyway, you, is there any last words you'd like to say to the viewers out there, Frank? Uh, if you've listened this far, you're a very patient person. <laughs> we will be Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Frank Collison. Thank you.